So our last guest player here is one of the most important. And my friend, Kyle Francis, can uh, start a video because to buy a second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth practice, you have to find one of those practices. And Kyle has dedicated his life to helping people do that. Kyle, share with us a little bit about what you do at Professional Transition Strategies as a broker as we dig into these topics. Yeah, well, so I guess probably what we do best is going to be making sure you understand what your equity is going to be worth over the course of time, right? So things have changed dramatically in the last 10 years, right? A whole bunch of individual to individual type of transactions, less than 30% of them are that way now, right? And yeah. so if you understand what the difference between, call it, you know, a two-pointer and a three-pointer are, right, in terms of your overall practice value, know where to take that shot, right? And so make yes. sure that your toes are behind the line. That's kind of what we're good at. And, you know, one of the things I can share in connecting with you is that, you know, NBA stars look for new contracts. And I go, I can't believe they paid that guy $87 million. And who knew if that guy thought he was going to get $47 million, but some agent said, you know, you've got $87 million. Uh, what do you do to help Dennis increase success and decrease stress as a multiple practice owner? And I would love for you to share a little bit about some of these very creative ways people are selling their group practices in a responsible and positive way. Sure. Well, I guess first things first is that if we know that that's something that you want to achieve, right? So if you have practice number one already in the books, you've already grown something to something pretty darn significant, well, then maybe now's the time to think about a transaction and maybe now's the time to start thinking about adding to it, right? And so if uh, one of those things is going to be adding to it, then uh, we work with lots and lots of buyers over the course of time and end up growing their ecosystems. Yeah. And uh, from the growth side, it's all about, you know, is this practice going to be the right next one for you? One of my favorite stories there is we were working with a guy that had a couple of practices in New York. Um, he decided that the next step in his career is going to be buying a couple of practices in Ohio right? Now, who gave him this advice? I have no idea, right? But now he's on a plane back and forth, and he, he had completely lost in the weeds of what was his life going to be like afterwards, right? Yeah. And so, you know, it's a, it's a good understanding of what it is that you want, right? And then an understanding of when is the right time to consider that transaction for the entirety of that group, right? Does it make sense to take it out to an existing group, a strategic buy or a, P, or a PE firm, right? So a financial type of purchase, um, but once you understand what it is you, you want your trajectory to be and what you want your back end life to look like, well, we can come up with a good solution for you. And, and in the broker world, you're helping people with find these first, second, third, fourth practices. Then you're also putting together deals for them to move on next days. Maybe, you know, kind of I asked April and we're on this together. You know, I'm a broker. Brandon Hill works on my team. I've been kind of sometimes frustrated with Dennis not really operating in a respectful way in the broker world. And then they only call me when they want to practice. And sometimes they're incredibly aggressive about it. And I'm like, why are you doing this? I'm not going to call you the next time when you're so angry that you, you know, I go, do you want to meet the dentist? They go, I want to know how many new patients he had in June of 2019. I go, oh, you need to meet the dentist first. So maybe since you've been doing this for such a long time, like I would like to tell patients, it would be nice if you didn't tell the dentist you hated them when they met them. I'm a dentist and that doesn't make us feel good. Okay. So maybe in a fun and friendly way, whether you're going for your second, your fifth, your first practice, what are some best practices just for operating with brokers? Yeah, well, so first and foremost, um, there are some not very good players on many brokers teams, right? <laughs> yeah. And so unfortunately, that can burn a whole bunch of buyers, right? So if they're going just based on what their assumption has been in the past on what their expectations have been with their interactions with their brokers, look, I can't fix that, right? So um, but what I can do is say like, look, just because you've had bad experiences in the past, I always talk about this. Look, there, there are good dentists and there are bad dentists out there. There are good DSOs, there are bad DSOs. There are good brokers, there are bad brokers, right? But really all of this is all a relationship game, right? right? Whenever it comes down to it, your relationship with your patient, the relationship with your bank, the relationship with your broker, all those kind of things, that does matter in total, right? And if you do end up thinking about this in terms of a long-term relationship, well, are you only going to call whenever you want something or whenever you need right. something? Are you going to act really, really badly whenever that's the case? You're probably not going to get called on the next one, right? I totally say, I say to, I say to Dennis, Kyle, I said, it's like the patient who never comes in for cleanings, but demands they get in the last week of the year and say, I'm your patient. Why can't you get me in? And it, it's just the relationship-based nature of it is so key. The next question I kind of want to ask you, and you alluded to with that one story, 
But where have you seen multiple practice owners make themselves want to cry inside, do some things that have annoyed themselves? I know you you highlighted already the dentists who didn't realize what it'd be like to have multiple practice in different states. But is there anything else you want to share with our audience on the reducing crying inside? Yeah, I would, I'll, t- I'll tell you what. I think that the biggest issue that people get into is going to be the idea that they're just going to have that second practice as a passive investment. That doesn't exist, right? It is very, very hard work to own multiple practices. Now, here's the thing. It's hard work to do dentistry. That's manual labor, right? So you're getting into a patient's mouth and you're going to be working like this all day long, right? That is very hard on your neck and those kind of things. It gets harder on your brain the longer it goes, right? So the more the, the more practices that you end up adding, it's just different types of problems overall. But many people think about these things as passive investment streams. And really, whenever you own a business, if you are going to be that owner, that CEO, um, just know that that is not going to come without total problems, right? Now, that some of those problems are actually kind of fun to solve yeah. in, in total. But if you go into it knowing that those problems exist and knowing that those are going to be problems you want to end up solving, you end up having a much better outcome than thinking like, hey, I'm just going to buy this practice and you know, just spin off $100,000 a year for me. It might do that but there will be work involved. I I love that. And also you can speak this authentically, Kyle, because how many practices have you owned or currently owned in your life? Yeah. So I've owned 25 myself, never more than five at a time. The brain damage got too hard for me. (laughs) So I ended up selling them either in chunks or in the individually to the different associates that that, that we, that we had in the practices, but in total, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't cut out for more than five, right? It was, it was, it was hard to do that type of work. So I guess I can speak from experience on that. Yeah, side the, moving, sure. the moving parts and pe- pieces of managing people is just very, very difficult. And a lot of times dentists say to me, must be easy to own multiple practices. I go, do you like other dentists? They go, I know, I don't like them at all. I go, well, you have to <laughs> deal with other dentists all the time. And you're very comfortable with your patient interaction box which at the end of the day is a pretty small box for predictability. But when you own multiple practices and then going back to Jared and all the who's, especially the associate dentist, I mean, if your associate dentist leaves, the practice shuts down. I mean, just yes or no, are there DSOs that have to shut a practice down because they don't have an associate out there? Yeah, we've sold sold many of those practices. So yes. And and practices can easily be a $35,000 a month expense to you to run these practices easily, that's on the low end. So if you don't have any associate there, so the vulnerability is very high and you have to make sure you're cut out for that. Um, In our cry less, smile more mantra, this is what the Transitions Basketball team is here for. What's either a message of inspiration, hope, you can be financial success, where you say, hey, multi-practice ownership can be really, really good because of this. Yeah. Well, so maybe tagging along with that same concept that this is not without work, um, it's also not without reward as well, right? And so if you end up looking at your total practice, let's say you're in your very first practice, right? And you have a six operatory practice and you think this is great, right? So maybe you've just paid off that last bit of the note to purchase the practice and suddenly the money is really rolling in. Um, what I can tell you is going to be, there can be a great reward in owning those additional practices as well, as long as you go in with the right mindset. And so um, whenever I think about it, I would say to somebody that, yes, this is not without work, but the upside is actually pretty big. I've seen some enormous success stories of people who've owned multiple practices and the type of, you know, multiples and values that they can get on those back ends of deals are, I mean, life-changing money, not just for you, but generational type of life-changing money. So anyway, it can be good as well. I like that. That's what we're here for, to share with people. Uh, I want to share that people can reach out and connect with you. You can email Kyle to salsa at dentalnachos.com. We'll connect you. But if someone wanted to reach out to you directly, Kyle, what would be the best way for them to do that? Yeah, probably just go to the website, just like everybody else. If you go to the professionaltransition.com website, so it's uh, both of them are singular, professionaltransition.com, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of us. Awesome. And now everyone else on the team, start your video. We're going to get a picture together for our basketball team. We have one more player, Eric White. We're going to be on stage. So uh, Marissa, you can be on the team too, but you're now, we now see you if you would like for our thing. It's okay. Marissa's our thing now. Perfect. So here's our starting five of our transition basketball team. Smile for our our picture here, guys. So uh, April, Brian, Kyle, Jared, thank you so much for being a part of this. I'm going to take us off Facebook Live. Hang around for just a minute, guys. Thanks so much.